I'm giving this lecture because this year, 2019, is the uh, Manor Public Library's 200th anniversary. Uh, in 1819, the good people of Manor decided that they were going to start uh, a public library, although it cost a subscription fee at the time. It was some sort of very... It's, it's like seven and a half cents a month or something. Right, yeah, which was probably a lot of money at the time. Um, you know, I and everyone who works here believe that uh, are, are very much partisans of the public library program. Uh, for society generally, public libraries are a really great institution. And you know, uh, as a person who works in a library, that every single person who comes into the library is a self-improver. Like every person, you know, whether it's the, you know, single parent trying to sort of uh, make a better life for themselves and their children, or whether it's a senior looking to sort of find out more information about programs that might be helpful to them, or just read the paper, uh, or any, you know, a thousand different kinds of things. What I wanted to do was talk a little bit about 1819 and the period around it in the United States. This is an era which has, has come down to us called the era of good feelings. And it basically comes from the sort of following. Uh, in 1817, James Monroe had been uh, elected by a gigantic landslide. I think it was 180 electoral votes to Rufus King, the, federal, the Federalist candidate got 37 electoral electoral votes at that time. The Federalist Party was in the process of collapsing. The Federalist Party, many of you may know or many may remember, uh, was the party of Hamilton, the party of the Northeastern establishment connected to mercantile interests in New York and Massachusetts, other places. Um, Monroe is a sort of an interesting character. He was much different than Madison, Jefferson, very much different than Adams. Adams was a very brittle character. If you read uh, Ron Chernow's biography of Hamilton, and okay, if you're writing an 1100 or 1000 page biography of Hamilton, you're probably a little bit of a Hamilton partisan. Those of you who've seen my Hamilton talk, which I've given a couple of times, will know that I have a great sympathy for Alexander Hamilton. But one of the one detail that Chernow relates is that when, uh, when John Adams would get frustrated with things going on in government, he would rip his wig off, throw it on the floor and stomp on it. Monroe was, although he was from Virginia, uh, was very much a conciliator, very much a moderate personality, uh, and, and not a particularly partisan personality in the way that Jefferson uh, and, and Madison and Hamilton, to name somebody who wasn't a president but was very, very partisan in his way, had been. And he went on a sort of grand tour of the country, and he went up into New England. This was the, he was the first Virginia president, Virginia-born president, to do this since Washington in 1789. This is in 1817. He went up to Boston. He toured the major sites. He climbed up Bunker Hill. On the 12th of July, uh, 1817, in a local newspaper called the Columbian Sentinel, uh, a local journalist, Benjamin Russell, wrote, during the late presidential jubilee, many persons have met at festive boards in pleasant converse, whom party politics had long severed. We recur with pleasure to the circumstances which attend the demonstration of good feelings. And uh, this is in, a, in an article entitled The Era of Good Feelings. And it was, there was really a feeling in the country that something had kind of changed. And we're going to talk about exactly what that was and, and why that was. Uh, but that uh, line was picked up on, I mean, it, it became popular even in the 19th century to refer to it, especially sort of looking back from the perspective of the 1860s when there were very many bad feelings. But it was picked up on by the historian George Dangerfield, who in 1951 uh, published a book, The Era of Good Feelings, which I heartily recommend to you all. Uh, it's one of the best books ever written about American history, when won the Pulitzer Prize, uh, written in a, in a sort of very beautiful conversational style. As a matter of fact, I have it right here. Um, yeah, I, I really recommend this book to anybody interested in American history. It's just an absolutely fabulous uh, book. A book that's aged well, too. There are some books on American history which, which do not age terribly well, but I think that it's full of really fascinating character studies about the various people involved. So what was about, what, was, what were the sort of fundaments of the era of good feeling? Well, the Monroe administration. Monroe, once again, was a conciliator. Uh, he was a guy with a real grip on the important aspects of American foreign policy. You'll remember that he enunciated later in his, uh, in his administration the Monroe Doctrine, saying that European powers could not uh, have colonial presence in the New World, in our hemisphere. But he was a guy who really wanted to uh, try and bring people together politically in a way that 
predecessors, and, and no disrespect to Jefferson or, or Madison, who were both wrought many good works for the country, but Monroe was really about trying to get everybody together. He, he says at one point, let me see if I have this. Uh, in his inaugural address, he had said, discord does not belong in our system. The existence of parties is not necessary to free government. So he was somebody who said that, you know, who thought that, now, the world of democracy is yet to see a system that involved no parties, and um, oftentimes this, there's a sort of a Goldilocks zone for parties, right? Like, no parties doesn't seem to work that, I mean, nobody's really tried it. One party works spectacularly poorly, I think we've seen. Uh, two parties seems to work pretty good. Three parties, we'll see how the British elections turn out. Uh, the more parties, like, I mean, this is one of the problems with Germany in the 1920s and 30s, is that they had so many parties that uh, you could always get enough people to vote for a vote of no confidence, but you could never get enough people to vote for an actual government. And that was a problem. So there was a sense of a nation. This is, so uh, the, the era of good feelings really runs from 1815 to about 1825, and the sort of, the, you know, once again, all periods in history are kind of provisional, right? And we're just sort of, history is a flow. The end of the War of 1812, which happens really technically in December of 1814, we'll talk about that in a minute, but, uh, and then runs to the beginning of the Jacksonian era, which, on, in which there were, I think, rather fewer good feelings, um, at least for some people. But there was a sense of nationhood that grew up in the United States, especially after the end of the War of 1812, that was really new. I mean, the, the United States, up until that point, in a lot of people's minds seemed really provisional. And once the War of 1812 was over and it was really clear that now we're a thing and we're not going away, there's a sort of moment where Americans start to think, well, well what are we gonna do now? Like what is, you know, we've, we've, we've overcome all these problems and now, like what are we gonna, like we've had all these negative things that we've overcome, what is it positively that we're gonna do? Once again, the collapse of the party system, the, uh, particularly in 1814, the Federalist Party had been sort of leaking influence ever since the uh, Washington Second Administration, uh, but really started to collapse during the War of 1812. There were uh, pretty severe divisions within it. They tried to have a sort of uh, meeting at Hartford in 1814. There was talk that uh, New England might secede the, the, they sort of went down to Washington with a, with a, with a slate of demands of what was going to sort of keep the country together. By the time they got there, the War of 1812 had been successfully concluded and they were like, well, they just turned around and left because by that point, their sort of whole, a lot of their problem was there was a very pronounced division about whether we should be fighting this war at all. And having won it, that issue became a lot less, had a lot less traction. Uh, the Second Great Awakening, so uh, this is a religious revival movement that took place uh, really throughout the colony, or th the colonies, throughout the United States, especially in Western New York. There were so many hellfire preachers rolling around uh, West, Western New York from sort of like the Finger Lakes over to Erie that the, er uh, the area was referred to often as the burnt over country. And then, you know, George Dangerfield sort of took this, uh, took this era and kind of highlighted all the ways in which there's this sense of optimism, really, in the country that, that seems very weird to us now. Uh, this, I don't think there's a huge amount of optimism abroad these days for one reason or another, but, but maybe it's worth sort of looking back at this period to sort of see what it was about Americans at the time that allowed us to have this sort of uh, sense of optimism, even though not everything in the world was going, perhaps, as we would wish it. This is the cover of Dangerfield's book. And you'll see, like, I looked for a long time for this picture. There's no reason for me to show you this picture except that uh, it was painted in 1857 um, by, the, by the famous American painter, uh, George Caleb Bingham. Uh, and it's Jolly Flat Boatman in Port. And for some reason, it turns up on a lot of copies of the covers of a lot of copies of Dangerfield's Era of Good Feelings, uh, even though I think it's about a slightly later era. But, but it's just kind of that sort of joyful American optimistic something, and I just, I think that's, I, I think that the, the people who put it on this book are really onto something, because it really does sort of illustrate a kind of positive demeanor of public life in those days. The War of 1812, the War of 1812 essentially started because, so the War of 1812, if you ask British historians, is a kind of minor theater for the Napoleonic Wars. So after Napoleon had come to power, the British blockaded the continent. 
the British blockaded European markets. The US government said, well, that's illegal. Like, you have no right, we're not at war with Napoleon, you have no right to stop our shipping. The British said, we don't care. Um, <laughs> and they were stopping American ships on the high seas, uh, sometimes impounding the cargo, oftentimes impressing the sailors, uh, about which the US government was very upset. Uh, and so finally, uh, it comes to blows, so to speak. And the British decide, the British, of course, have this gigantic navy. And they uh, start blockading our ports. In the course of one, uh, and raiding in the country, in the course of one raid in 1814, they raid into Washington, DC. They end up burning the White House, not to, not to pile on uh, Mr. Trump, but his comment that something was like the worst thing that had ever happened to a US president. No, James Madison got chased out of the White House right as dinner was being served. Uh, the British soldiers ransacked his wine cellar and basically took everything that wasn't nailed down and lit the building on fire. That, I think, is the worst thing that happened to a president, you know, aside from the ones who got shot, but that's... <laughs> um, but so, um, the, I was about to say, there's the famous story of Dolly Madison saving the famous uh, portrait of George Washington. The, uh, a lot of the War of 1812 was, was a little bit mismanaged. We tried to invade Canada. That turned out s remarkably poorly. At a certain point in 1814, there starts to be a feeling in the country that, why are we doing this? Like, maybe we should, because we have this, you know, long-running beef with the British, right? They're not very positive toward us because they feel like we took a, a large part of North America from them. Um, and I, you can understand how they would be a little bitter on that score. But a lot of people in the country are thinking, well, this is costing a lot of money. And ironically, a lot of people in Britain are also worried about, I mean, you hear sometimes people say that war is an obscenity. It's obscenely expensive. Uh, and in those days, especially so. Uh, it just, and, and really what was being fought over was nickels and dimes in a certain sense. I mean, it wasn't like, you know, you were going to see some large part of, of somewhere that you could then exploit for colonial gain. Like, this is really a kind of push and pull between two countries, neither of which is going to take over the other. There's a kind of, the, the British are also a little bit upset with us because of the Louisiana Purchase, the Spanish too. And the reason is because that, that territory that Napoleon had sold us was originally Spanish territory, and the Spanish had, had dealt it to the French on the premise that they would not sell it onward. <laughs> and so the British and the Spanish regarded the Louisiana Purchase as illegitimate. Eventually, uh, Andrew Jackson leads uh, a ragtag band uh, to the Battle of New Orleans in, on uh, January 8, 1815. If you listen to Johnny Horton's uh, 1952 hit song, The Battle of New Orleans, it's sadly not a great guide to things that actually happened. Much as we would like to believe so, the British, we did not chase them all the way down the Mississippi. They retired in pretty good order, and they might have won the battle, actually, if a few things had gone their way. One problem was that the attack on this part of the field, so this is the canal, this is the Mississippi right here. Part of the problem was that the, in the sort of main part that didn't take place in this cypress swamp over here, the British commander had forgotten to bring the thing that would get them over the, he had forgotten to bring the ladders and the other sort of siege gear, so it turned out kind of badly. But they did take this part of the line, and if they had supported the attack properly, they probably could have turned the flank. So uh, fortunately, uh, a, lot of this, a lot of the success, a lot of the reason we were successful in this particular battle uh, was uh, the excellence of uh, American artillerists. A lot of the British commanders were taken off by grape shot being fired into the, uh, into the British lines. Now, the British, once again, did not run through the brambles where the hares couldn't go. They <laughs> retired to their ships and went and took Mobile, uh, which they could very easily have turned over to the Spanish. But fortunately, the Treaty of Ghent had been signed in the last week on December 24th, 1814. You'll notice that this is about two weeks before this battle actually takes place. But of course, m news moved very slowly, uh, and especially if it was transatlantic news. Uh, and so by the time this had all happened, the war was over anyway. And it was really a matter of both sides kind of seeing the, the light of reason, that it was not, uh, that we had more to gain from each other economically. Uh, the war was once again fabulously expensive, and really it, it just made a lot more sense to to make peace. After this happens, 
Andrew Jackson is, a, is an absolutely fascinating character. Um, and and uh, there are some sort of modern comparisons that could be made, which I will eschew uh, for the sake of, of the peace of the realm. But Jackson then, after his successes in Louisiana, goes on and essentially, there's a little sort of confusion uh, in, at the heart of US policy in the end of the Madison administration. But he decides that he uh, is going to take the southern part of Mississippi and, and the northern part of Florida, uh, which he does kind of on a sort of freelance basis, uh, working on the premise that it's easier to get forgiveness than consent. He, John Quincy Adams, Quincy, by the way, not Quincy. If you live, if you ever live in Massachusetts, you will discover that that name is pronounced Quincy. I lived on Quincy Street, uh, so I, I learned it well. But who was Secretary of State in the, in the Madison administration was just absolutely tearing out his hair because every, you know, uh, the, we have this very tenuous thing with, with Great Britain, Jackson goes down into Florida, hangs a couple of Scotsmen who had been, uh, one of them was selling arms to the Indians down there, and one of them was selling something else, I forget what, but, but Jackson hanged both of them. And the, you know, the people, have been, you know, John Quincy Adams like, oh my God, like, we just, like, do we, we don't need another go around with the, with the British. But fortunately, the British decided that a couple of Scotsmen were a small price to pay. I mean, they didn't, they, at that point, had so many other, other concerns. <coughs> So now we come to Monroe. Uh, Jefferson says of James Monroe, turn his soul wrong side outwards and there is not a speck on it. And he really is uh, an exemplary figure as a president of the United States. He's, uh, he's a Virginian. Uh, he goes to William and Mary for a very brief period of time, in 1775, I think, before joining the Revolutionary Army, serves with the Virginia militia. And that's, of course, the, the key to success in American public life in the post-revolutionary era, like all these people. This is why many of you will remember uh, Hamilton was, who had this very uh, uh, prominent position on George Washington's staff, was constantly arguing with Washington trying to get a field command because he knew that service in battle was going to be key for somebody who wanted to be prominent in public life after the war. You see a lot of uh, pictures kind of like this. This is uh, John Lewis uh, Crimmel's Election Day in Philadelphia, painted in 1815. And it's, you know, you see a lot of flags, you see like people out on the street. There's a kind of American civic life going on. And it's, it's at this point much less about conflict than it had been in a sort of earlier era. It's, it's much less fundamentally conflictual. There had been a sort of underlying conflict in the country between the, the more mercantile northern parts of the country and the south, which is more agrarian. If you, look, if you read Jefferson's writings, he's very uh, adamant about the idea that America should be sort of a land of small freeholders working in agriculture, maybe some larger. Um, Jefferson is sort of very iffy on the question of slaves. At one point, he says uh, something like, he writes that, that, that uh, slavery is like holding a wolf by the ears. Uh, you, you couldn't do it safely, but you couldn't safely let it go either. And I think that that, among the sort of what you might call the more civilized people down that way, was a, was a I mean, holding slaves is fundamentally uncivilized, let's just be clear. But, but I think a lot of people did feel that way, that, you know, what are we going to do? In South Carolina, the majority of people there are slaves. And so they're, they're very worried that if they, you know, these people probably have a certain bitterness toward the white people down there for having enslaved them. Um, so there's a real nervousness even among people who, like in sort of ideal terms, would want to, uh, would want to free the slaves uh, about what would be the case afterward. But one sort of thing that, that, that one sort of change that takes place in the United States toward the end of Jeffersonian period and on through uh, the presidency of, of Madison, is that there's a realization among people in the Democratic Republicans, and that's the sort of political party that, that Jefferson and Madison sort of found, uh, that there needs to be industrial growth. There need, we need to be able to produce things. If we're just going to be agrarian, we're always going to be beholden to these other countries that can produce that can spin, that can have factories. Um, 
in this period, and this is something that, that Hamilton sort of started, we're constantly sort of sending people over to England. So in England, if you knew how to build a spinning mill, you, it was illegal for you to leave the country. Uh, and you could not give out those plans or you might very easily be imprisoned or executed. They were very serious about that as a trade secret, but of course it didn't really work. And so uh, there are numerous people, I say numerous, not more than you know, a couple of dozen or so, but who came from Great Britain who had just been around enough spinning mills that they knew how one worked. And then once they got here, just built them. Uh, Hamilton very much wanted this as a policy. I mean, he, was, he had his sort of people kind of feeling around for people who might know how to build a spinning mill. But part of the problem is, with, with developing this is, one thing that you need uh, in order to do this is a way for the things that are getting produced to get to markets. Americans at this time are on the move. They're on the move west. This, it's in this period that we start hearing terms like manifest destiny, the idea that we have the destiny to take over the rest of this continent. Why do we have it? Well, it's just, we just do. People, when they move westward, tend to move at the same latitude, by and large. And the reason is because if you have seeds that work at one latitude, you can, you know, the closer you stay on that line of latitude, the more certain you can be, or the more likely it is, that they'll still work when you get to the new place where you're going. People in the Trans-Appalachian West, and this is the Western Reserve, so at this point, this is still, uh, uh, Ohio becomes its own state in 1803. Re, I think. Well, what is it that they want? I mean, most of, this, most of the settlement in Ohio at that point is not here. It's in southern Ohio because you want to be close to the Ohio River. Why? Because it's a tributary of the Mississippi. And here's the thing. If you're growing wheat and everyone else around you is growing wheat too, it makes it kind of hard to sell. What you want to do is get your wheat to a place where they have more money than wheat, like New Orleans, and this is why the Erie Canal gets built, right? Because the cities along the lake, of which this is one, uh, want to say, look, here's a way that you can get your produce. You don't have to go through Cincinnati. You don't have to go down through the Mississippi. You can take it up to Lake Erie, go through the Erie Canal, get it to the Hudson, and then get it to New York. It's a shorter trip. Uh, well, from Cincinnati, it's a push, but you see what I'm saying. Like, this is, why, this is one reason Cleveland becomes the, the fifth largest city in the United States. This is another reason why, I mean, the Civil War really makes Cleveland, those of you who, who know the history, that, that uh, by the end of the Civil War, Cleveland is this gigantic industrial powerhouse that's connected to all these other sort of industrial conurbations around the, around the northern part of the United States. But you have these sort of like, this Western movement going on. One of the problems is, so, you know, the, the Jeffersonians start to say, well, maybe we need to build roads and stuff. Maybe we need to build infrastructure, I guess is a better way of putting it. And then there are other people sort of in the more traditional parts of the Democratic Republicans who say, well, where in the Constitution does it say that we get to do that? You know, if you look in the Constitution, this had already been sort of litigated in the days of Hamilton, and especially in the, now you'll notice actually in Federalist number 44, I think, it's one of the ones that, Monroe, that Madison wrote. Madison basically says, if the Constitution says that the government has the power to do something, it also implies that it has the means to do it, as long as that doesn't violate the, the political culture. Right? So this is what's called the doctrine of implied powers. Uh, and it has a very long provenance. Uh, Jefferson, when this is first enunciated, is just absolutely aghast at this idea. And a lot of people in Virginia are too, because this. The, qu the question is, you know, then, I mean, it's a matter of federal power, and people are very hinky about federal power, especially the further south you go, although not exclusively there. But by the early 19th century, uh, even the Democratic Republicans, or the, I mean, first of all, the Democratic Republicans have spread up into the parts of the country, especially into New York. Democratic Republicans are not especially active as a party. At a certain point, I think people up in, up in New York and New Jersey parts further north, realize if you're going to get anywhere in this country, I mean, federalism is a dead, you know, is dead as a dormouse. So we need to get into the Democratic-Republican Party 
so that we can get a share of the spoils. I mean, this is really the sort of era, early era of the spoil system too. It's around this time that uh, the Second Great Awakening happens. It's a little unclear exactly why this gets going. There's a first one that happens in the sort of 1750s, and then another one that happens later on in about the 1850s. But America goes through this spasms of religious enthusiasm, which is, which is fine. I mean, it's, this is really, some of it is like very kind of, there's, a, there's, there's, there's sort of a kind of hellfire and brimstone dimension to it too, but there's a more sort of general, uh, generous and, and moderate uh, aspect of it as well. What you see is these big meetings. Once again, it's a big sort of community building type experience. You can see people with these tents in the background and they're all hanging around with speakers on the stage. I think I have another picture that has almost the exact same. Yeah, once again, tense. These things would happen for days, and it would just be people hanging around, listening to sermons, um, and trying to get to a sort of more authentic relationship to the Christian religion, trying to, uh, trying to sort of find their way between Roman Catholicism on the one hand and Unitarianism on the other. Sort of those are the kind of two the two poles. And two of the big figures, and I put this in here, I did, Charles G. Finney and Lyman Beecher. Lyman Beecher is, is particularly well remembered because he's the father of Harry Beecher Stowe and Henry Ward Beecher and a whole, it's his whole clan. And I have this sort of, this short quote, I don't want to go too deeply into this, but I think this is really, this sort of tells you a lot. Finney's early clerical critics included Lyman Beecher. Beecher, however, wanted to forge an ecumenical evangelicalism that could unite evangelicals to combat the influence of Unitarianism on the one hand and Roman Catholicism on the other. Accordingly, Beecher arranged for Finney and his supporters to meet with more conservative evangelicals at a conference in New Lebanon, New York for a week in July 1827. This is a little sort of later in our period, but uh, I think it tells you something important about what was going on. Both sides wanted to encourage revivals. The Finneyites agreed not to call their colleagues cold, unconverted, or dead. The other side consented not to call the Finneyites heretics, enthusiasts, or mad. Uh, on the rights of women to religious participation, they had to agree to disagree. And one of the effects of the Reformation is uh, you get a kind of open market in religion. Uh, this is, you know, the Catholic Church, like, it's called the Catholic Church because Catholic means all-encompassing. But once you get, you know, once Luther nails the theses to the door and then uh, manages to wait out for a year at the Wartburg in Saxony uh, and not get burned up, all of a sudden you have this situation in which you have different denominations, and it takes a while to get going, but you have different denominations sort of uh, uh, all competing with each other. Which, in a way, is a good thing, you know, I mean, because you have, uh, it, it's funny that there's this sort of tradition, I say funny, I don't mean funny ha-ha, I mean funny strange, to quote Gomer Pyle, um, that you have these, there's this sort of tradition of biblical literalism, right, which is, in a way, not, like, everybody interprets, like, but you have sort of different interpretive ideas, and what you get is the individual being able to sort of look at these different takes on what the Bible means, I mean, this is the real uh, importance of the, of, the, of the Reformation, not so much Luther, although Luther is important, but the printing of the Bible in the vernacular so that people can actually read it. This is one of, the, one of these times I'll do a lecture on the English Civil War where there were a lot of, like, uh, a lot of sects running around England, running around Britain, who, you know, the, the, the royal officials would say, well, you know, God whatever, the government, and they would say, well, it doesn't say, if I'm reading the Bible, it doesn't say anything about this government, so, like, you know, I'm just going to, uh, I'm just going to go my own way. Here, you know, once we get past the point where we're, like, burning people about it, uh, you get to a situation where people can hear scriptural interpretation and really make a decision about what seems reasonable to them, and that's, I think, a real step forward in, in human life. You really, you know, you shouldn't, Montaigne says at some, at some point that the French essayist, you know, we put a great value on our opinions when we're willing to roast someone alive. And this is, you know, now we get to a point where it's okay that we have different ideas about what Christianity means or what the Bible means. We all have, you know, uh, we have these various ways of reading it and interpreting it. It was funny, I, I remember having a student at the University of Washington, who, and I was talking about the theologian of some, 
or the, the theological college of some church, and she was like, well, what's a theologian? And I think for a lot of sort of like baseline believers, they just, you know, one kind of, you know, a Christ, Episcopals or like Methodists or like Baptists, like it's not until you think about it a little more that they really have like very pronounced doctrinal differences, not the kind that you'd want to put somebody on the stake about, but something that you'd want to sort of allow people to think about and say, well, I think this is, the, this is what it means, or I think that's what it means. We're moving out into the West now, and we're relating uh, very pronouncedly differently to the Native peoples. This is Samuel Seymour's 1819 illustration of a Kansa war dance, and I believe this is the first uh, illustration done sort of by an artist of the kind of this sort of moment in, in the life of the, of the, what we would call the Western tribes at this point. This is, this is the, you know, not the West as it is now, but we're really running up against the native peoples as we start moving out. So in the early part of the country, it had been the sort of Iroquois Confederation, which was a very uh, highly organized, highly stratified political entity. It's, it's, it's one of the sort of ironies that we tend to think of the native peoples as having kind of no history and kind of existing in this sort of like Edenic you know, whatever, the Iroquois Confederation was very complicated and very highly developed politically, uh, the same way with the, the peoples of the Southeast, the Choctaws and the, the Cherokees. And, but it's going to become clear in this sort of process of Western expansion that uh, this is going to be an issue in a way that it, it hadn't been before. And this is going to become a, big, a bigger issue when we get into Jackson. Um, Jackson had some very unfortunate ideas about uh, what might be done in this regard. The Panic of 1819, this is the first real depression that we have in the United States. There had been some sort of problems, especially uh, around the time of the Whiskey Rebellion uh, in, the, in the 1790s. But what had happened was that uh, there had been sort of great demand for American goods and thus uh, great sort of land hunger for people moving west. And a lot of these people who had bought up this land had done it on credit because they didn't have enough cash. The idea was uh, the, the, the Bank of the United States will make cash uh, available and with the premise that if you're starting a farm, there's going to be so much demand for American products that you'll, people will be able to pay it back. In 1819, what starts to happen is there's a slowdown in the world economy. The bottom kind of drops out of the cotton market. And there's a kind of a, a cascading process in which people's loans get called. And the bank of the, uh, the second bank of the United States becomes, gets into real difficulty. This has an interesting Ohio dimension. Okay, so there's two branches of the, bank of, the, of the bank of the United States in Ohio at this point. One is in Cincinnati. The other one is in Chillicothe. Does anyone know where Chillicothe is? Yeah, just south of, I had to look this up. I'm not from the state. But I asked a bunch of my colleagues who are from the state, and they didn't know either. Um, Chillicothe was, and does anyone know why it was in Chillicothe? It was the state capital, exactly. It was the state capital from 1803 to 1812, and then from, or from 1803 to 1810. Then it wasn't for two years for reasons I haven't been able to figure out. And then from 1812 to 1816, and then I think, it, I think they shifted it north. But, um, but so the state of Ohio decided, well, we're going to put a tax on the bank of the US because our farmers are getting wiped out, right? So we need to do something to kind of rein in this, this federally empowered institution. And they did it in Maryland, too. So in 1819, a court case finally works its way up to the Supreme Court. This is the famous McCulloch versus Maryland case. Uh, and the Supreme Court eventually decides uh, the power of the federal government supervenes the power of the states. So the, the, if the state, the power to tax is the power to destroy, is, is, is what they say in this. And what they mean is that the states can't tax the federal government. The power of the federal government supervenes. So if the states are allowed to tax the Bank of the United States, that essentially means the destruction of the Bank of the United States. And the federal government, I mean, this is one of the great innovations that Hamilton, Alexander Hamilton, had brought to the United States. He was the, responsible for the foundation of the first bank in the United States. And once again, it was an implied powers issue, right? Because when he proposed the bank in the United States, a lot of people, especially in Virginia, start thumbing through the Constitution, Sam Irvin style, 
saying, uh, I, don't, I don't see bank mentioned here anywhere. Hamilton says, well, look, the Constitution says we do have the right, the government does have the power to regulate currency and trade. So if we have the power to do that, we also have the right to the means. And that's the foundation of this bank. At a certain point, the state of Ohio, I'm trying to remember how this went, it, they had decided that they were, that they were uh, owed, the state was owed $100,000 by the bank. So they went to the bank and took out $120,000. And then it turned out that that was too much, so they gave back the $20,000. And then by this time, the thing had been kind of rolling around for a while, and the federal government said, we're just going to call this OK for now. Like, you guys can keep the $100,000. But just going forward, the power of the, of, the, of the government, the power of the federal government is going to be supervenient here. The power of the federal government is going to be, uh, is going to uh, have power over the states. And really, at this point, there's a lot of feeling among the kind of governing classes in the country that this is the way things have to be. I mean, one of the big changes between the United States in the post-revolutionary period and the United States in the Jackson period is Jackson, the Jacksonian era is the era, is the sort of first era of populism. It's the era of the kind of common man. And that's, a, that's one of the real changes that happens from this period in the United States where the Madison, or excuse me, the Monroe era is still an era when politically prominent people uh, are, are, are running the show much more. I mean, one of the things that happens in the, in, the, in the Jackson era is that the property qualification. So in the old days, like, voting was who? Sometimes it was free blacks, although between 1790s, after 1796, most of the states say free blacks can't vote. Um, but it's mostly, so it's white men who own property, which is about, who own taxable property, which is about 6% of the people in the United States at that point. Over the course of the period between the end of the Monroe administration and the end of the Jackson administration, that gets liberalized to white male suffrage, basically. So they're not going to give the vote to women. That doesn't happen until the 20th century. Um, and they're not going to give the vote to blacks. The, that has to wait till even later. Um, but one of the problems that's going on is, uh, is the question of slavery, right? So, and, and this is the thing that it's worth remembering about the way the country is. Slavery is the, is the, uh, is the underlying narrative of the United States, almost to this day, arguably, but certainly between the founding and uh, the end of the Civil War. It, it, it changes after the Civil War. I mean, I'll just, if, if I can editorialize for a moment, one of the most uh, annoying things as a, as a person who studies history is to hear the common assertion that uh, the Civil War was not about slavery. I mean, people say, well, it was about states' rights. It was about one particular right. Uh, and, and for anybody who doubts this, I invite you to read the documents of secession. The Southerners were very clear about I mean, in all but one or two of them, it's explicitly mentioned. They knew exactly what the, what the issue was. They weren't, I mean, it wasn't about free navigation in Mississippi. It was about, it was about slavery. And the Northerners knew it too. <clears throat> because, of course, uh, where do all the presidents come from? Washington, Virginia, Madison, Virginia, Monroe, Virginia, Addison, or yeah, Jefferson, sorry, Addison. Jefferson, Virginia, Adams, Massachusetts, but that's because he's made nice with the Virginians. And why is this? Because power is slanted over to the southern side because they get to count this population. They count as three-fifths of a human being, which is obviously repulsive, but, but they, get to, they get to count those, and so they get to, those people don't get to vote, but you get to have uh, members of Congress on the basis of the fact that they're there. And this uh, ends up in one of the most remarkable, catastrophic uh, moments in American policy, or in, in American history, the Missouri Compromise. In 1819, it becomes clear that there's enough people in the Missouri Territory that they can now uh, apply for statehood. So the question is, are they going to be a slave state or are they going to be a free state? There's a weird sort of politics about this. Jefferson thought, well, 
let's expand the slave states out to the west because it will make the slave owners more diffuse. This is a weird way of thinking about it. But so Jefferson, imagine for a moment that you believed that Jefferson ultimately wanted to get rid of slavery. Then you can also believe his sort of line about if slavery is more diffuse, then eventually the states will get, like the slave population will be, and the slave holding population will be so diffuse that the states will get rid of it. But the northerners are thinking, well, wait a minute. The more states that we allow to be slave states, the more it just accentuates the problem we already have, which is that the power is, is slanted over to the slave states. So around this time, um, Maine, which up until this point had been a part of Massachusetts, also uh, is in the process of applying for statehood. And the part of the, the compromise that gets worked out is that if you admit a slave state, you're going to admit a free soil state at the same time. And that the slave states, uh, they, they sort of create this line, which oddly enough does not contain Missouri. Uh, and then later on, um, the, the problem will move into Kansas with very unfortunate consequences. The, those of you who've read a bit of US history will remember the, the whole bleeding Kansas. Uh, but there's a very nasty process of debate that goes on. Uh, so when this is first uh, mooted, a, uh, a fellow named Talmadge, he's a Democratic Republican, but he's from New York, says, we need to limit the formation of, of slave states. And there's a very nasty process of, of, of debate that goes on in 1819, so that there's a session uh, toward the end of it uh, when, they're, when they're debating this. Uh, Thomas W. Cobb of Georgia says in the middle of the session, you've kindled a fire which all the waters of the ocean cannot put out, which seas of blood can only extinguish. I mean, that's a fairly hair-raising thing to be saying in a congressional session, right? To which Talmadge replies, if a dissolution of the Union must take place, let it be so. Is civil war which gentlemen so much threaten must come, I can only say, let it come. He's saying, if you want to make the issue about slavery, and if, and if that breaks up the Union, that's fine. We're willing to fight. That's the hill we're, we're ready to die on. And the interesting thing is, these guys are both Democratic Republicans. These guys are both notionally in the same party. <laughs> and so this is part of the kind of breakup of the Democratic Republicans that results in the formation, first of all, of the Democratic Party. And really, this is the Democratic Party that comes down to us, although it's changed very much since the moment of formation. And its great competitor in that era, the Whig Party, which died out. Um, but Jefferson says, you know, this is another one of those sort of late Jeffersonian uh, utterances. I had for a long time ceased to read the newspapers or to pay any attention to public affairs, confident that they were in good hands. That's never a good idea. <laughs> and content to be a passenger in our bark to the shore from which I am not distant. But this momentous question, like a fire bell in the night, awakened and filled me with terror. I considered it once as the knell of the Union. So Jefferson himself was afraid when, this, when the whole debate about this is going on that slavery is going to be the thing that breaks up the Union. And I mean, uh, it's one of those, so if you watch the Civil War documentary, the, the, the Ken Burns one from 20 years ago now, Shelby Foote says, you know, slavery in a weird way is the kind of failure of the thing that we really do well in this country. We're great compromisers. I mean, we think of ourselves as being rock solid for principle. But the real, you know, if you look at the actual history of the United States, we find ways to compromise with each other. I mean, this is the, this is the sort of the history of the Constitutional Convention of 1787. These guys, you know, coming together and saying, how are we going to have a system that accommodates both the rights of these large, populous, mercantile states in the North and these more diffusely populated states in the South? Well, we'll, we'll have the Virginia uh, we'll have the compromise on the Virginia resolutions where we'll say we'll have representation on the basis of population, but then we'll have an upper house where everyone gets two. Now, I think Foote is really right in a lot of respects when he says this. I mean, really, uh, 
And this is, if you want to talk about the kind of degradation of American political culture, and in a way that I think has been going on for at least 40 or 50 years, it's not a new thing. But it's this sort of unwillingness to, to, to come to reasonable compromise. I mean, you can say, you can be critical of this or that aspect of, of whatever policy like comes out, but like the substance of policy is one thing, and the, and the way you put the policy together is another. And we really, uh, since the 1960s, I, mean, I don't think this is a new thing, have, have developed a political culture that's very much against reasonable compromise um, for, for a, a number of reasons that don't bear delving into right at this moment. But, but this, and this is the thing about Monroe. Monroe really wants, I mean, M Monroe is a Virginian, right? So he, under, he knows what side his, his bread is buttered on. But what he wants is a compromise. What he wants is for people to, you know, uh, be able to discuss these things and come out with a sort of reasonable way of doing things that's not going to, that's not going to blow the republic up into tiny bits. In fact, this basically just puts the problem kind of on the back burner. But it keeps reemerging, and once again, so uh, this is the problem I think with what Foote says. This is the kind of thing on which it's very hard to compromise, right? Because human beings are being held in chattel slavery. Human beings are being held as property. And that's a whole other thing than, you know, the tariff question or free navigation of the Mississippi or even the, you know, the doctrine of implied powers. Those are things that you might, that reasonable people might disagree about. Keeping human beings as property is something that, at least from the perspective of, the, of what comes to be called the abolitionist side, and this is a side with a long provenance, by the way. I mean, Alexander Hamilton is a member of a group in New York, the New York Manumission Society, who are working to, and Alexander Hamilton, by the way, you know, the guy had some problems, but uh, one of them was not the view that Africans were just deficient people. Like, he really thought and, and he was on record, you know, writing this, that, that Africans were, you know, had the same capacities as everyone else. Um, but so if you're in this sort of abolitionist mode, this is really not something that you can compromise on. This is not something that, that you can be okay with. And it's very hard. And by the same token, from the Southern perspective, if you get rid of slavery, or if you engage in political actions which are going to result in the getting rid of slavery, you've got a whole bunch of problems. One is, how are we going to organize our economy? The slave system, for a long time it was believed uh, that the slave system was uh, unprofitable. Uh, that has been debunked by a lot of real, recent history. The slave system was very profitable. Uh, it was, in addition to being extremely brutal, there's a, there's a the one book, I'm trying to remember what it's called, there's River of Dark Dreams, that's another, that's one very good book, and then there's The, ha the Half Eight Been Told, I think is the other one that's recent, that basically shows that slavery was a very profitable system. So, uh, so once again, if you're a Southerner, you're thinking, A, this is a profitable system, how are we going to organize our agrarian systems if we don't have access to this unfree labor? Also, how are we going to live if there are these people that we have enslaved who are now free? Once again, uh, this is a thing that goes back a long way. Uh, uh, there's a debate. I'm just going to sort of uh, allude to this without really wanting to get too deeply into it. In the debate about the origins of the Second Amendment, the people who, there's, there's one school of thought, and, and this is not an unproblematic position, but there's one school of thought that points out that if you look at the debates in the Virginia House of Burgesses, um, one thing they're very worried about is uh, the idea that, so they, everybody is liable to be in slave patrols. So you have groups of armed whites going around making sure that the slaves aren't organizing to, to free themselves or to murder everyone in their beds, etc. And um, the... Uh, one of the arguments against a sort of centralized professional army that is made in the Virginia House of Burgesses in the, in the 1780s is um, if we say that the, that the only sort of militia really can be sort of the national federal militia, 
then the Northerners are going to take away our ability to have these slave patrols. Patrick Henry says this explicitly. As a matter of fact, like, he goes <laughs> so on and on about it that other people in the House of Burgess are like, you know, cool your jets, bud. This is getting a little out of control. Now, there's an argument that says then that the, that, the, that the Second Amendment is the direct consequence of that. That argument has some problems because of the sequencing of when the amendment was actually, the Second Amendment comes around like much later after this, so there's a debate about that. But the issue of slave patrols was definitely a consideration for Southerners, and, and the sort of reason for their being there continues to be an issue for Southerners, the fear that the enslaved population is going to rise up uh, and, and slaughter the masters. So what you have is this very insoluble conflict that goes on and on, and which people are really, I mean, if you look once again at Bleeding Kansas, really ready to kill about. I mean, people are not, as far as I can tell, ready to kill about the Second Bank of the United States. But they really are willing to kill about slavery. I mean, John Brown kind of makes his, makes his bones by slaughtering a whole bunch of people, many of which were innocent at Pottawatomie Creek and other places. So what we get in the, as, as the Jacksonian era arises is uh, a fundamental change away from this era of the era of good feelings, the era when there's a kind of uh, feeling of, of sort of nonpartisan unity, so to speak. Now, you don't want to overplay this. There's always political disputes. But uh, I, I think that the way that the historians look at this is that the kind of temperature was a little lower. But what you get is, first of all, the split of the Democratic Republicans that uh, eventually results in the foundation of the Democratic Party on a sort of more populist kind of basis. Once again, this is a kind of common man, the sort of, the, the defining feature of populism, if you look at the sort of academic study of populism is there's a people and uh, they're sort of pure and good and then there are these elites who are bad uh, and apparently at times we need people from the elite group who will lead the, the pure and virtuous people to overpower the other elites, whatever, it's a complicated problem. But, but that's, that's in a way like Jacksonian populism, right? Jackson is not from the sort of it's not one of these guys out of the streets. He's like a fairly well-to-do sort of person. Made his bones militarily, once again, but um, the, the, the Jacksonian era is much more about the power of the common man as opposed to uh, the sort of parties and the, and the sort of uh, well-known figures. Manifest destiny, once again, this idea that uh, westward movement, westward expansion is a kind of... Uh, religious quest in a way. I mean, it's, it's very sort of, uh, it's very much cast in those terms that it's not just we're going to go get some stuff and make some money. It's that we're going to sort of bring civilization to the whole area between the seas. Um, once again, uh, nullification these are, the, the last of these two things are sort of the, Jackson at one point is annoyed about the, about, the, about the second bank in the United States and says the bank is trying to kill me, but I will kill it. American government goes in these sort of like waves, right? So there's, uh, there's the kind of federalist period where uh, it's all about the assertion of the power of the central government uh, over the states and then there's a kind of reaction to that. And then the, the Democratic Republicans sort of say, well, maybe we do need a little more centralized power. Like once the Federalists have kind of uh, fallen apart, it becomes more okay. So John Quincy Adams, uh, just to give you a sort of example, when John Quincy Adams was the Secretary of State, he wanted to be very careful at all times not to say anything nice about the British. Because he was a northerner and he knew that if he did, there were people who would say, well, he's really just a sort of crypto-federalist, right? The Federalists, the, the party of Hamilton, had been relatively pro-British. The, the Democratic Republicans, the party of Jefferson, had been weirdly pro-French. I mean, and I say weirdly because, you know, this is 1789 when it's like, uh, 
let's, you know, it's 1793 when they really do start the head chopping for real, but, um, but you know, Jefferson is all about these like ideals of human liberation. Hamilton thinks this is really weird, by the way. I mean, Hamilton, there's a certain point at which he says like, I think it's funny that all these slaveholding people from down in Virginia are like constantly going on about liberty, their liberty. Like they don't seem to understand what's really up with liberty, but let's just leave that aside for a moment. Um, but so once again, in this sort of era of good feelings type period, one of the sort of defining features of it is the Democratic Republicans get more sort of okay with centralized power, with the centralized with the f power of the federal state, the power of the federal government. And what you then get is Jackson, who's much more about uh, devolution of power to the states. And so once again, there's this sort of power and reaction. Why is it worth looking back to the era of good feelings? Well, I mean, it's a really interesting period. And it's, you know, a period that I think that it's easy to be nostalgic about now when we're in a period where uh, there's a very pronounced partisan division. People argue that it's the worst it's ever been. It's not clear to me that that's necessarily true. It's very divided and, and there's not a lot of people out there like, yay, compromise. Um, <laughs> I mean, com like, compromise is a good way to get yourself primaried out in either party at this point. Um, but uh, what you have is a sort of uh, situation in the United States where there's this sort of space for reasonable people to disagree about how the country is going to be run. Uh, and it's partly because we're sort of in a process of figuring out who is it that we are. I mean. We had spent the preceding 20, 30 years being like, well, we're not the British. Like, we used to be the British, but now we're not. We're this new thing. And, you know, fighting against the British, trying to sort of find what our place is in the international system. And now that's over. After the War of, 1850, War of 1812, that's over. And now we're in this sort of situation where we're sort of, where we're trying to figure out, okay, positively, who are we? We have, at this time, Jefferson and Adams, toward the end of their lives, like building their legacy, their intellectual legacy. So, I mean, this is one of the great tragedies of American political life, I think, that Hamilton was killed in the duel with Burr. Because he didn't get to sort of build that legacy. I mean, this is why, the, the, in a way, the, the Hamilton musical is an important cultural moment. Because Hamilton is really kind of forgotten in a lot of respects. Hamilton, I think, was one of the, was the most profoundly influential of all the founding fathers. If you look at the institutions that he founded, the National Bank, the Mint, the Coast Guard, uh, he got, uh, you know, he resolved the, the debt crisis. He got American finances. He got the finances of the country on a sustainable basis. I mean, lots of people wrote interesting things about the United States. Hamilton did interesting things, but then he gets killed in this absolutely idiotic duel with Burr. Burr, by the way, is trying to like recoup his political fortunes, and it has absolutely the reverse effect, sadly, for him. Um, but that uh, Hamilton doesn't get to kind of build his legacy in the way that Jefferson, Adams, Madison get to. Um, but what you have is these, you know, now like the United States getting out of this revolutionary period, the, the War of 1812 is the sort of end of what you'd call the revolutionary period. And now we have this kind of free flowing kind of process of figuring out who it is that we are and what it is that we're going to do. Once we get to the period of Jackson, things get a little more intense. And I think ever since then, and even to this day, we're in a process of wanting to kind of, uh, I mean, I don't, think it's, I don't think it's coincidental at all that a library gets founded in this little town out on the Western Reserve uh, in 1819. I mean, this is really frontier area still in 1819. But what do people want to do? Okay, we're established. Now we're going to have a library so people can, you know, read books and improve themselves. And this is a very era of good feelings type of thing. I mean, this is, I admit I'm speculating a bit here, so. <laughs> but, I, but I think it's a reasonable surmise to make. Because this is the kind of period in which that's the kind of thing that would happen. This is the kind of period 
uh, in which we, uh, you know, are entering an era where the Hamiltonian system and the system that's been created by the founding fathers, uh, one in which uh, people who want to improve themselves can, right? This is meant to be the difference between us and Europe. In Europe, you're born into a sort of place in society, and that's where you, you know, if you're born a peasant, you die a peasant. In the United States, we're going to have something different. We're going to, you know, human beings aren't angels, so we have to in have institutions that will, that will uh, limit their malign tendencies, right? But uh, if you want to be an improver, if you're willing to work hard uh, and understand that sometimes things don't work out, like, we want to create and we're going to create institutions that will allow you to do that. And that's the, I think, defining feature of this era in American history, and one that uh, I think uh, we can legitimately look back on uh, with, a sort of, with a sort of fondness, uh, especially in the current circumstances. Okay, thank you for coming out. Um, <laughs> but